Welcome to Cambridge Forum. Tonight, we're working in partnership with Penn New England as it presents the 2015 Howard Zinn Freedom to Write Award. And we host a conversation about witnessing a people's history of Ferguson with bloggers and activists, Janetta Elzey and D. Ray McKesson. So Janetta Elzey grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. She says she did not know she was an activist until somebody told her that she was. Galvanized by the shooting death of Mike Brown, she turned to her social media accounts to show the world exactly what was happening. She has highlighted also and represents the importance of women to the Black Lives Matter movement. She now works as a field organizer for Amnesty International. DeRay McKesson was at home in Minneapolis watching TV coverage of the protests in Ferguson when he decided he needed to be part of them. McKesson rented a car the next morning and made the nine-hour trip to Ferguson. He planned on protesting for two days and stayed first one week, then one month, and just last week he moved and became a resident of St. Louis. Jabari Asim is a poet, playwright, essayist, fiction writer, journalist, and editor. That, that's a lot. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, he spent 11 years at the Washington Post serving as deputy editor of the book review section, children's book editor, poetry editor, and editor of the Washington Post Education Review. For three years, he also wrote a Washington Post writers group syndicated column on political and social issues. Welcome to Cambridge Forum with Janetta Elsey and DeRay McKesson. As organizers and bloggers in the Ferguson protest movement, they have engaged and unified disparate voices in the wake of the August 9th, 2014 shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Their newsletter reports on local and national calls to action, relevant news and information, and narrates the real on-the-ground story of the protest. Their activism has focused an enraged community and helped transform a cycle of tragedies into a movement, working to make sure the world does not forget the names Eric Garner, John Crawford III, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, and others, countless others. I'm Jabari Asim, Editor-in-Chief of The Crisis, and I will be your moderator for this forum discussing witnessing a people's history of Ferguson. Welcome, Janetta Elzey, and welcome, DeRay McKesson. Good to be here. We've, we've heard a little bit of your, your stories, your journeys to how you became activists, uh, but one of, one of the things that has struck me well, first of all, being in New England, I just want to say I'm really thankful for the work you guys do, not just on the ground with your feet and your bodies, but particularly with that newsletter. I've been in situations where people have said, I heard such and such happened in Ferguson. And did it happen? And I always check to see if you guys have, have tweeted or posted about it. It hasn't happened until I've seen it there. So I'm <laughs> grateful, grateful for the work that you guys uh, continue to do in that regard. But one thing, uh, DeRay, I know that you've talked about this. Um, the new generation of activists seems to have a very different view of leadership. It, it doesn't seem to be so hierarchical or, or charismatic based. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, you guys' approach to leadership and, and how you make decisions and, and, and move through the struggle? You know, in the protest community, we, um, we believe that everybody has a capacity to lead in some way. So when we talk about our work, we are just two people, right, who are telling a story, but there's so many other people whose names you don't know who have contributed to the storytelling and who have done incredible work on the ground to keep the protests alive. Um, one of the things that we also believe to be true is that like the truth is actually damning enough, right? And if we can just help people understand the truth, then like more people will become radical and that will be, uh, we'll be in a place where people can't like stop the movement. That like if there's just one or two leaders and they, they can be co-opted or they can be sort of, um, many things can happen to those people, but when it's so diffuse and there's so many people who know what's going on or who can call an action today, that that's actually like a power that we've not yet seen before. And I think our generation is like uniquely primed um, to sort of operate in that space because of our access to social media, because of our access to technology, and because of our ability to just communicate and connect with, with, with each other differently. I think about like I had lunch with somebody that I met on Twitter today, a student in Northeastern, and we had like a great lunch about about protest and activism, and it's like our ability to connect in those ways are just so different. Mm -hmm. and, and the speed at which you make these connections is, is amazing yeah. to the rest of us. In terms of this new model, Janetta, has it created greater access for women to have influence in terms of strategy and direction, et cetera, in, yes. in your view? 
Yes. Um, I feel in, in August, after, maybe like a week after uh, Mike Brown was killed, that's when people started having like closed door meetings mm. and um, side conversations, and it would just be men. Um, but because of how, um, I guess you could say how active I was, like on the ground, so just like being a point person for people to drop off supplies, or if you're coming from out of town, like literally I was one of the main people who was constantly tweeting all the time, so I would tell people where to go. Um, so it's, it, my position was really different in that I was not kept out of the rooms. Mm -hmm. I would get invited into the room, but as a woman, I would be talked over, wow. or I would be, um, they would answer questions for me, um, or just not ever let me talk, just to say that they had me there. Um, so, thanks to Twitter, I was able to just walk out the room mm -hmm. and make my own space and work, work how I wanted to work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that this is different for women because if you think about the past, like Ella Baker or someone like her, um, you know her name now, but back then, you know, women were doing a lot of the work, but the men were always constantly in front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now it's just like people, Everyone can be seen. It's a thousand folks working. And here it's not men just being in front. It's men, women, trans folks, gay folks, bisexual folks, all working together. Um, and we're standing side by side. And I think that's a very big difference between the past and now. And uh, this is sort of a tricky question, but I know that you have encountered some resistance from what we might call old school leadership in terms of how things should, should be done. Um, I'm an outsider, so what it looks like to me is that people observed what you guys were doing, then tried to come in and say, this is how it should be done. I know I'm simplifying it, but can you clarify for us what exactly what, what was what's going on? Ooh. I'm trying to get us in trouble, <laughs> Lord Jesus. You want me to answer? You know, so we have historically, this would be like the, the nicest way to say this, is that sure. we have struggled with Al Sharpton, right? Okay. Oh. And what's interesting about him, and I will not talk about him much because, you know, it'll ruin my timeline, is, um, you know, he even recently publicly said that, the, that this conversation would not have happened if it were not for the protesters, right? Which was like a, which is a big thing for someone like him to say, someone that we struggle with for so long. But I do think there's this interesting thing where there's some people who, who have one image of what leadership looks like, right? And it looks one way to them. And because we are not operating in that way, they struggle. And I think sometimes we, we, have, we hear that struggle. Um, but there are so many other people who have been incredibly supportive. We spent a morning with Diane Nash and her son in mm -hmm. Selma. We were, we were together for a couple hours. It was just like the, the two of us, um, her son, her daughter-in-law and her. And like, we got some great advice. And she was just like, do it your way. She was like, mm -hmm. She was like, you know, the only advice I can give you is like, trust yourself and do it your way. And like, we've gotten a lot of good advice. Um, we got a lot of good advice in Selma and there've been a lot of people who did stand with us, but, but it is something, and I'll start talking um, about like, remembering the people who, who could have stood with us in August and chose not to, mm. right? So there were people when we were getting like tear gas and we we're running from rubber bullet, you know, Netta got shot by a rubber bullet, like people weren't with us. And then all of a sudden when protests became cool, everybody's calling, everybody wants to take a picture, everybody wants an email. And it's this thing about like, you could have, right? And I, mm. you know, we met with the CBC and a congressman said, DeRay, you know, they told us not to come. And I said to him, they told us to go home, right? And we like chose differently. Mm -hmm. um, and there are so many people who did not choose to stand with us. And I don't, I'm not upset with them, but I also remember. Sure, sure. I wonder what he meant when he said, they told us not to come. Who, who is they? Well, I think there's something about like, that's not his congressional district. Oh, right? like I see. Okay. And I do think there's like some regionalism, right? That like sure. people, people, some people didn't come for reasons that seemingly were valid. Um, but it also is this thing of like, you know, you couldn't have told me that I could have swore that NAACP had like a social justice SWAT team that they were going to sit down to <laughs> right, right. help out. And that and did not that didn't come. happen. It didn't go. Yeah. Um, so people like tweeted us how to like deal with tear gas and stuff yeah. like nobody, the, the people I thought would come down and help didn't. Yeah, I even saw social media from places like uh, Palestine saying this is how you deal with, with social media. So one of the other things that was amazing was how quickly um, you were able to attract global attention for, for what you were doing. Now, Netta, you, you grew up in St. Louis. Did ever in your wildest thoughts think that this kind of movement would, would launch 
from a place where we're both from? Uh, to be frank, hell no. <laughs> um, no, but yeah. now looking at it, it's mm -hmm. perfect. It's yeah. everything that's wrong with America is right there in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. um, and to answer your question before, I think patriarchy is something that we struggle with a lot in the black community, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, especially with our church elders. Um, it's a lot of, you know, um, in a way I've heard to listen and to um, be respectful. And by doing those two things, it almost is replacing my own opinion. Mm. So in order to respect or um, be mindful of my elders, I have to silence myself and the things that I'm dealing with to listen to how they think we should handle things in 2015. Mm. Um, so that's a struggle. But back to your question about St. Louis, I think St. Louis is a breeding ground for all the racism in the world. <laughs> um, it is, you know, Missouri was the last state to free the slaves, and I think there is a particular reason as to why we're in the situation where we are here today. Um, and I mean, I don't know one black person who hasn't experienced racism at an early age in St. Louis. Sure. Period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at what point did um, and Dore, I'm sure you can speak to this a little bit because we've already talked about in the introduction how you came from another state and you were motivated to come to the, to the white hot center of conflict, as it were. Did, how soon did that begin to happen? Where it was f at first local people responding in the neighborhood immediately to what happened to Mike, Mike Brown, but then all of a sudden you're getting assistance and, and developing alliances with people traveling from elsewhere, how soon did that begin to happen? And how did that begin to happen? Um, I think the first few people who contacted me, well, it was clearly from Twitter, okay. and it was some folks from Chicago. Um, and they came maybe the second, maybe August 12th, they came. Okay. And they asked me, what do we need? What do we have to bring? Um, are you guys okay? Do you need food? Do you need water? Do you need blankets? tents, whatever, um, and I just told them to bring everything and bring yourself and hurry up because we needed like, we needed help and we needed witnesses because this was, mm. it was just so crazy like, and we can't, um, it was just so crazy you couldn't make it up. And I was so glad to see that so many people came. And literally that first month it was people from Chicago, people from LA, um, people from, I met a few people from England who came. Um, the monks? Yeah, the monks from Tibet came. Mm. Um, and it was just, it was amazing how many people came to St. Louis to stand with us. Mm. Now, uh, DeRay, you, you, you spoke, uh, you made a comment very recently I thought was pretty interesting. Um, in response to when the, the two policemen were shot, someone asked you about fear and about sort of like being uh, in the line of fire, as it were, and you, talk, you, you, you said some pretty interesting things about you're almost accustomed to it in some way now because you, you've been out there on the front line for so long. How does that shape your, your psychology? I mean, at one point, I mean, do you, when you start, are you like extremely afraid and then over time uh, you get accustomed to it? How does that work? Yeah, so a couple of things, and I'll, and I'll push back on this like language of the front line, right? It's language sure. that we actively don't use because we would okay. say that black people in America are always on the front line, right? That there's like yes. this, yeah. that there is this confrontation with the, with the state that just happens because of your body. Yeah. Um, so we don't, we don't want to privilege this idea of like the front line and protest because we would say that if protest is always confrontation and disruption, that like we are always in that state. Mm -hmm. And I'll use that to segue into this conversation about fears that I remember in... Um, in August, I remember the last time I was afraid for my life. And I was like, it, you know, in August, uh, the police at the beginning sort of stayed near vehicles. I like remember them by, they were like always near vehicles. And then it was like, no vehicles. They're just like on the streets sort of running crazy. Um, and there was like a night where they like stormed a crowd and I ran with my hands up and I was like legitimately like, they might kill me. And it was like, that is A, crazy that it's happening, but B, the fear just took up too much space, right? It was just too much. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. Um, and the last time I thought Netta was gonna die is that we, um, it was when Von Derrick got killed and I was in Minneapolis and Netta went down to Shaw, which is the neighborhood that uh, Von Derrick was in. And, all, and we, had, we hadn't really texted about it, like we were both tweeting about it. Um, and then all of a sudden my phone starts like buzzing and it's Netta and she sent me all her passwords. It's like Twitter password, Google password, Facebook password, and like no message. It was just like the passwords. And I like mm -hmm. knew that it meant that she thought that she might die that night. And I'll never, 
Um, I'll never forget how that made me feel. And like, we weren't together, like we, you know, she was there, I was not. Um, but it was like this moment of like, we, it just was a moment. It was a moment that reminded me of how much I love Netta. Um, and it was a moment of, um, of like remembering like the trauma that we are experiencing in protest, right? Like that was just a, I'll never forget that. But in terms of the fear, you know, we get death threats. I've blocked 11,000 people on Twitter. Wow. Um, Glenn Beck, I don't know if you saw that ridiculous video where Glenn Beck says that I am um, funded by ISIS and, and, you know, and trying to up in democracy, but it is, uh, it is not easy, but it is this thing about like the work is bigger than us, right? And we made a commitment in August not to be silent anymore. Like we made a commitment to give up silence and to talk and fight back. I mean, it's something that we choose every day and it doesn't make it easier. Um, but it is this thing about, for me personally, like the fear takes up too much space. So I like continue to wear the vest because like it, it, it's like, you know, it's like a security blanket for me. And I know the police know it and, you know, Lord knows whoever else is trying to harm me. Um, but I just like, can't be afraid. And in blackness, we, we negotiate this fear with the state as a part of our life. Do mm -hmm. you have anything to add to that, Netta? Um, I always get emotional when we talk about yeah, that sure. because I have a 14 year old sister mm. and um, we are like working through trauma mm. um, and so it's hard for me to like focus on the emotional part because then I'll get stuck okay. um, and then I get emotional and I cry and I hate crying <laughs> but um, so I, I lost my mom last year in January to lupus mm. And so when I'm like, after she passed away, I'm pretty sure if she was still alive, I would not have gone out in August. Mm. But after losing my mom, I feel like I had nothing else to lose. Wow. Um, and, and feeling that I have nothing else to lose, I also know that I have to fight because I have a sister. And I want her to be able to walk down any street. And I want her to be anything that she wants to be the same way my mom did for me. Um, and that includes protesting sure. and that includes coming to places like here or working in amnesty which is an all-white organization <laughs> um and and trying to bring about some type of change so uh, yeah fear i think the last time i had fear was probably the same night um in ferguson when the national guard was just driving up and down the streets and flying above trying to find people mm. um it was just like random gunshots and it was just like really 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 crazy um and elon james was with me that night and he like caught it all on um he recorded it and i hate listening to that recording because i we legit like we're about to die i think it's crazy um so it's just after, after living through that, after thinking you're about to die about three times where I think I was legit going to die in Ferguson, nothing else phases me anymore. Um, death threats, you know, that's, that's really, I, it's, it's different. It's not something that I ever thought that I would experience at 25. Mm. Um, and it's definitely not something that I would expect just because I want black people to be treated like people in this country. Um, so it's unfortunate. Uh, Dore, when you talked about leaving where you were, were you in, in Minnesota initially? Yes. Um, it reminded me of a couple of analogies. One was uh, Viola Liuzzo going to Selma uh, because she just felt motivated that she needed to be there. She had a, a similar impulse. And it also reminded me of, of John Lewis talking about his family objecting when he first joined, joined the movement. But people close to you, how did they respond to this, this idea? You're, you're in, in Minneapolis, you're working, you're professional, and all of a sudden you're, you're hitting the road, going to the center of conflict. What, did, you, did you have to deal with uh, people close to you saying, we kind of wish you wouldn't do this, or this isn't, isn't your struggle, or were they more like, what can we do to get you there? What, what was the response? I think they were more like, DeRay's made a choice, right? Like, so it was, yeah. it was one o'clock in the morning. I saw it on Twitter, I saw it on Instagram. Um, and I was like, I'm gonna go right now, right? At one o'clock. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, mm, that doesn't seem like a smart idea. Cause like, I don't, you know, I moved to Minneapolis for the work. I was a senior director of human capital. I managed all staffing for the district. It was a role similar to the one I had in Baltimore where I, where I was the special assistant in the office of human capital. Um, so I had like a lot of responsibility in the school system. 
So I didn't have a lot of friends in Minneapolis. Like I moved there legitimately because kids are what radicalized me. Like I taught sixth grade math. Like that was like my thing um, before I became an administrator in the central office. And um, so I waited until my best friend, this guy named Donnie, I waited until he woke up. He lives in Chicago. And I like <laughs> didn't want to, I didn't want to call at one o'clock because it wasn't like an emergency. It's like at like eight o'clock. I was like, Donnie, I need to talk to you right now. And he answered. Um, and I was like, Donnie, I think I'm going to go. And he was like, if you feel like you should go, you should go. So I like got in the car, drove nine hours. I put on Facebook, like I'm going to St. Louis. Um, I hope somebody I know, like knows somebody who, whose couch I can sleep on. Um, and, and somebody from, I was a Teacher America Corps member, somebody from Teacher America got in touch with Brittany Packnett, who like found somewhere for me to stay. And I stayed on their couch for two days. And I went to Bowdoin and a, and a Bowdoin classmate of mine, she saw my Facebook post and I stayed with her the next seven days. And that was like the story of my protest. So when I went out, you know, I didn't, I don't know that very well now, um, but we didn't know each other. But I knew like nobody in the state of Missouri before I, before I started protesting, which is sort of why I tweeted so much, right? Cause I, mm -hmm. I like, I was experiencing all this stuff and had nobody talked about it. So I was like, I'll just tweet. Um, and you know, I had less than 900 followers on in August, right? I have like 70,000 now, but I had um, less than 900. And like, I was just trying to, I was telling the story of what was happening to myself as much as I was telling it to everybody else, especially in August. Cause like I legitimately didn't know anybody. But one of the things that attracted me to your tweets initially was that almost from the beginning, you were challenging the official narrative. And, and you, you, you seem to be emphasizing this idea that there are other, other stories. Was that, um, I mean, was that your, your disposition before you got there? Or did, in the course of your work, respond to all these different stories that were, were coming out that turns out weren't very accurate? It was like being there and then to piggyback on the last question. So my father is supportive. He, um, you know, we talked the other day and he was like, Dere, I can't watch any of you on TV. I can't see your tweets or Facebook because I won't be able to sleep. So he's like, just keep me posted. So like we okay. text and stuff. Um, but he like, he's like, I won't be able to sleep if I see you on TV or if I see your tweets. Um, but in terms of that questioning, there's something humbling in that changed my life when I got tear gas. I will never forget, you know, it was like the first night of the curfew. It was like eight o'clock. And then they taught us we had to go home, but the curfew was really at midnight. So they, that, mm. I was like, I don't know what's happening. And I remember, uh, see, and this is so naive now, but I, I don't know how many people have been tear gassed, but I remember um, when they shot the tear gas, tear gas is colorless, but it has like smoke. So the canister came and I was like, Dre, I'm like, I'm smart, right? Like, look at the smoke and just dunk over where the smoke is, right? Mm. Which is like not the way to run from tear gas. And um, the smoke has no direction, like it just no correlation to where the canister is going to fall. So literally like out of a movie, like two canisters fall in front of me, like one in my right leg, one in my left leg. And it's like, this is wild. And I can't run backwards because there are cars behind me. To my left is a gate. And it was like this moment of like, I have to, some way I'm gonna go through that cloud. Like I gotta get to the other side. Um, and Tigress makes, we had, Ned and I actually met at the first medic training that ever happened where they like teach you how to like deal with tear gas. What's it called, what kind of training? A medic training. Medic training, okay. Mm -hmm. They teach you how to like flush people's eyes. It was like seven people at the first one and Netta, that's where Ned and I met. Um, but tear gas can make your contacts see or to your eye and I wear, and I wear contacts. So I remember running through and I like, got on the other side, my face burns. Tear gas sort of feels like this really crazy peppermint scrub. Like you're, that's like how your face feels, like mm. pepperminty, but like in a not good way. Um, and I remember, <laughs> I remember opening my eyes and being like, I'm not blind. I was like so pumped. I was like so excited not being blind. Um, but it was that, in that moment, I was like questioning everything. Cause in Bal I'm from Baltimore and I thought the police were potentially corrupt and maybe like not the brightest people I'd ever met, but I didn't think they were racist, right? Like I, mm. I didn't think it was like this deep sort of conspiracy against black people. And in Missouri, I'm like, you could not convince me otherwise, right? That like, it is a system that is, that is racist at the root. Um, and seeing it then and being tear gassed or being like that night Ned is talking about like, we got escorted to our cars with people like M16s across their chest. Um, they were, the SWAT teams were doing like, they were going in residential neighborhoods, like putting flashlights in cars. Like I remember I was like hiding under my steering wheel and I was like, this is wild. Like mm. that is just crazy. Mm. Mm. You so, really do talk in tweets. Like it is insane. I love it. <laughs> Side <laughs> note, Twitter. sorry. <laughs> now, my next question was gonna be, and you touched on this already, but I wanna hear Netta talk about it a little bit, how you joined forces. Uh oh. <laughs> so yeah, I did meet him at the street medic training. Um, Around that time, I, I did a lot of like food 
like packing sandwiches and packing lunches um, and passing them out at the protest because people would literally be there from the morning to early the next morning. Um, and so we were concerned, like, how are people eating? Um, mm. So we were doing that, and the lady's house who we used to make the sandwiches at, she had a street medic training with these wonderful people who are from Chicago and New York who came and hosted the training for us. Okay. Um, and that's where I saw DeRay, and he had on these red shorts and these red short shirt, red shirt, red shorts, and red shoes. And I'm just like, who is this weirdo? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> like, we were just, like, talking amongst each other. And then I'm like, uh, he, like, introduced himself or something. I'm just like, oh, okay. <laughs> and that like, always has that face. If y'all have ever seen that as side eye. Uh, like, I don't know who that it is. It was on 2000. <laughs> I just, you know, you had to be friendly, but I just didn't know who to trust. Sure. Still don't. But, uh, yeah. you know, I was just like, who is this character? Yeah. And, um... I kind of just left it at that, but then DeRay would be out there, like, so I would leave maybe at like 2 a.m. because my best friend and I both have families who are just like, you all should not be out there. Like, y'all are, you're all women, you're, you're short, <laughs> you're, you're this, you're that, you need to go home. And so we would push it until like our phones would keep going up and then we would leave, so like 2 a.m. But he would be out there, and so I finally like followed him on Twitter. Um, and then DeRay started the newsletter, and our mutual friend Justin Hansford, he called me and he's like, Netta, we started this newsletter, it's so great, da 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 da. I'm like, okay, like that sounds real nice, what do you want with me? <laughs> mm. uh, and then eventually he asked me, did I want to join? And so I came on on the fourth issue, I think. Okay. So we've talked a little bit in, in sort of general flattering terms about the newsletter. I've talked about how much I've come to depend on, depend on it. Can you guys talk a little bit about, for those who, who may be unfamiliar with the newsletter, what it does, what it aims to do, and what the process is like? It looks very labor intensive to me. Oh, it uh, is. In, in term, <laughs> terms of putting it together. I'm glad it looks like it. Go ahead. Now you start. No, it's yours. It's ours. I hate you. <laughs> um, um, you go, stop. Surrender. Hands up. Hands up. You. So DeRay had this great idea that we didn't have like one central place to have the news because after, and I agree, after Trayvon Martin's death, um, people really didn't know what else to do or what else to read or what else was happening in Florida. Um, you would like have to depend on CNN and, you know, after the trauma or black anger goes away, um, the story goes away too. So we didn't know. But there was all this stuff going on about Ferguson and no one could keep track of it all. Um, you know, favoriting on Twitter is just like out of control and it's easy to lose things. Mm -hmm. So what did you do? You asked around, right? Why don't you tell the story? I mean, you can tell the story of what it is now. I'll tell the story of the history later. No, go ahead. Nah, yeah. You know, it's funny. We spent so much time together um, in the protest, and now we, we're not protesting every day, so it's always great to be back physically together. <laughs> uh, so it was like, Netta said, when Trayvon got killed, there was no way to, like, just didn't know what was true. And we wanted to create, like, a, a source where, like, we could say, like, this actually was real, this wasn't real, tell people what to do. Uh, what to follow. Um, so it's like a couple sections. We keep the tracker. Today's a 223rd day of protest. We do that mm -hmm. tracker. Um, we do the news and, and every, we get like, we look at articles every morning and we, it's on hiatus right now. It's coming back. And um, we look at articles every morning and then we read them and then we write little blurbs about them. We take like the best tweets that we found and we like put those in and then we do like a calendar of like events. And it was a way to like just keep the message going because like the reality is like the trauma is actually so consistent, right? Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, people would say to us like, I can't believe, like there'll never be enough news for you to do this every day mm -hmm. would be like what people would say. And it's like, if, if only you knew, like we read a ton of articles to figure out like the 10 we're gonna put in the newsletter um, when we do it. And it started out with about 400 people and it has about 15,000 now. So we, um, we are proud of it. And like, and, and the ability to just like keep a running log of like the news. And how can people access it who don't currently? This is the movement.org. This is the movement.org. This is okay. the movement.org. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, we just had uh, Martise Johnson at the University of Virginia brutally beaten by the police a couple days ago. And a lot of the social media, um, you know, it's sort of like running 
photos of him as an honor student. He's the only black member of the honor committee at University of Virginia. Then they show a photo of him in the street after he's been brutalized by the police. And a lot of these images come up in discussions about uh, the politics of respectability. Ooh, I was just about to say it. The, the, the idea that if, that if we're honor students and, and, and we dress a certain way and we speak a certain way, that it uh, protects us from uh, looking, being perceived as a threat. And, and, um, but it seems that uh, the current generation of the movement is, has really almost put that notion to bed. Am I, am I reading that right? Accurate. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about why it's been put to bed and, or how, how that, how that it, it doesn't seem to be, um, you know, the argument that it once was, that if we put on our Sunday best and, you know, we, we have a nice haircut and we carry our Bibles, we'll be safe. Uh, but it doesn't seem to matter whether you're an honor student or, or someone with a criminal record. You, you still end up on the wrong end of the policeman's baton, gun, etc. cetera. Uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but how, how has that been discussed in, in, in your strategic circles and, and in the movement? Um, well, I, for one, I'm just anti-respectability politics completely, like, to my core. And <laughs> whew, that's, like, the true statement ever. And um, I was raised on respectability politics, which I'm sure plenty of black people were, um, especially in, like, middle, uh, middle-class American families. Sure. So I was always taught that I had to be just as good as the white kids in grade school, just as smart, just as fast in gym, just as um, great in art or, you know, singing and just do just as well um, to be, to get almost just half of the, the um, awards or anything like that as the white kids would. Um, and so kind of maybe around my like 20, my like 20 years old, I was just like, why am I doing this? Like, what am I doing this for? Why do I have to be, um, always compare myself to whiteness to find some type of level of satisfaction with myself? Um, and so in this movement space, it's always interesting when people talk about good Negroes or, you know, if you, maybe if y'all, if he would have just been on the sidewalk, he wouldn't have got killed. Um, if, if Trayvon would have put his hood down, if Ayanna wasn't sleeping on the couch and was sleeping in the bed, um, maybe she wouldn't have been shot by the police. Um, and it's just absolutely ridiculous because in every instance, even if you are an honor student like that, the, the student is at the University of Virginia, mm -hmm. or if you are walking in the middle of the street with your friend because the sidewalks are raggedy in Ferguson, it does not matter, you are still black. Um, respectability politics are deadly. I tweet this often because they're not going to save you. Um, so the same way people, I had my reclaim, reclaim Martin Luther King shirt on earlier because I love the fact that we are taking back the narrative of Martin. People put him as the face of respectability politics. You know, he was the good one. Martin was the bad one or Malcolm was the bad one, but either way, both of them were, were killed. Mm. They killed, they shot Martin in the head. What does respectability politics get him? You know, where does being a good black person get you, even if you want change, and you're going about it non-violently or violently, <clears throat> where does it get you? And it, when in St. Louis, for example, when the policemen were shot, it seemed as if there was an immediate uh, attempt to, to cast the protesters as, as violent, threatening kind of people. I, I, I saw you made, made a face as soon as I, as soon as I brought it up. <laughs> but, I'm talking about the shooting. But the, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> is that like it is, uh, the response from the police about the shooting is why we protest, right? So Belmar, who's the chief of police in St. Louis County, immediately, like I was there, we were there, like they had not even finished putting up the tape and Belmar, like I'm getting tweets being like, Belmar said that the police got ambushed and the, the guy was embedded in the protesters. And I'm like, I'm here. They don't know. They haven't gone up the hill really. Like nothing has happened. Like Belmar, what are you doing, right? And it's this thing of like, you are consciously and actively like using inflammatory language to try and discredit a movement of black people, right? And like, that is not what policing is supposed to be. Like you don't get to make statements like that with no evidence and no, not talking to any witnesses. And then what we found out later was that like, at best, uh, the shooter has tangentially been involved with the protests, right? And that our lives might have been just as at risk as, as the police. 
um, and I say all that to say, and not even, you know, I say all that while I acknowledge that he's a black man that we're fighting for too, right? That like there is that tension in that and we can say that and we're not afraid to name that. Um, but the shooting, in, when I think about sort of respectability politics, the shooting aside, is there is this interesting thing where like blackness is not allowed to be complex, right? Which is why like the suits and the ties and those sort of things become this image because it's like this, this monolithic and fixed notion of blackness that we always have to operate in. It is either that or it is either thug or it is either straight black man. It is like not, it cannot be all of those things, right? Mm -hmm. And that we, and we push on this narrative about respectability because we, because blackness is complex, right? There are like many shades in blackness and that is really important. And what respectability politics does is it masks that in honor of this one model of the blackness, as Nana said, is like actually deadly. Like either trying to be that is deadly or thinking that that will actually save you in any way or protect you is a farce. Hmm. Okay, I, I think I wanna um, ask you one last question and then we should probably open it up, open up the discussion for, for other people. Um, but I'm curious about um, alliances or the, the nature of, of, of the movement. How can we characterize it? I mean, should we say it's a, a multiracial co coalition? Is that wildly inaccurate? It, it, I mean, it, you, you talked about people coming from England and Tibet and, and all these kind of places. Is the movement consistently taking that shape or not? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, I just I think about like the work that I do on the ground when I am in St. Louis, like the coalition building that we do. Okay. Um, so like the I think the biggest coalition we have is the Don't Shoot Coalition, okay. um, and it's a group of lawyers, community members, doctors, um, just regular folks off the street, um, protesters, and the table looks like any old thing like it's it's everybody mm. uh, we have muslim folks we have christian folks we have folks like me who are not religious mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you have black folks white folks um latinos it's just like it's very that space is very mixed okay. um, and that that's the which coalition is that? don't shoot coalition don't shoot. um but then you have like the black table space where it's folks who are doing the work, protesters, organizers, community members, and it's strictly just for black people. Um, so we can discuss things that we feel are leading us to black liberation um, in St. Louis and nationwide. Um, and for, <clears throat> as far as like the overall movement, in my opinion, the race might be totally different, but I've experienced um, it's predominantly black, and that's fine for me. Um, but we do have lots of, and I don't like calling them white allies because okay. I feel like al the word ally is almost like a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. um, because I feel if you're going to be in this work for black liberation, that you have to be fully in it. Like it's not, you know, I feel like allyship almost allows you a space to, to exit. Mm -hmm when it gets mm. too uncomfortable and we don't have a space where we can exit because we're always black. So I, I require more of the, I, you know, they're, they're my friends now, but the white folks who are doing the work, right. um, I require a lot of them um, to be fully embedded in our liberation. And I'll just add that, you know, so I agree with everything that I said and, <laughs> And um, we are not afraid to say that this is about blackness, right? Okay. That this is a, that, and we believe that in fighting for blackness, it will lead to freedom writ law, that like, that our struggle is a struggle that once we win, will allow other wins, right? But we are not afraid to say this is about blackness, right? And we can stand in that. Um, and then we're also really clear about like our burden. We have many burdens and none of them are white guilt, right? Mm -hmm. And like we can say that and be okay with it. Like our, the burden we carry is freedom and justice. Um, and that is not making other people feel comfortable about the pain that, or trauma that we have ever felt or that we continue to feel. And that doesn't change the way that we build community, right? That like, like Netta said, there, the community is of so many people who don't necessarily look like us, but a condition of sort of being in the, in the work is saying that this is about black people, right? So if you can't, you know, I don't know if you stand with me if you have to water it down with all lives, right? Like, I don't actually know if you are like a committed to the work that we are trying to do. And I extend that to even, you know, the famous people I won't name, um, who can't actually stand publicly and say Black Lives Matter, right? Like mm -hmm. that 
that is a challenge to us. Um, and we are not afraid to say black, right? Because you already talked about the fear that, that is always present in the lives of black people. But, um, but there is, there is power in speaking it. And we know that to be true. Okay. Hi. So Hi. Um, I didn't even know I was following you on Twitter. I mean, I knew I was following you on Twitter, but uh, didn't know I was going to be here with you guys today. So thank you for coming. Um, I have a very quick question. You just said something, Duray, that made me like stop. I'm like, oh my God, I got to talk to you. All right. You said, don't be afraid to say that this is about blackness, right? Um, here in Boston, we have a very big problem, right? Because this, this movement is about blackness and, and about blackness being brought to the forefront because it's been pushed back for so long um, that when you say things like black lives, black lives matter, um, a lot of people will try to insert erasure moments, right? Like, no, 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 it's, it's all lives matter, right? And that's something we've been struggling a lot with here. Um, so I just made a post real quick um, on Tuesday about St. Patrick's Day and everyone's saying, happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm like, all holidays matter, right? Because <laughs> I just, love it. <laughs> like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, for every one of them. You know, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, why are we separating it? Like, you know, right. we can't separate our stuff. I so, it. I mean, how do you bring that back? Like, you understand what I'm saying? Like, for for people who aren't black and don't understand why we're making it about, and we're actually now coming to the forefront and saying this is about being black, and this is about being recognized and recognizing the problems that come associated with being black in America today. You know, so how do you guys address that all lives matter business that happens? Thank you. I take two quick things. One is. One is that we are people, and I'm using people broadly, not just black people, who are afraid of conflict, right? So some of it is just standing in Black Lives Matter and just standing in it. Like Black Lives Matter and like if you want to, if, if we need to struggle through it together, let's struggle. But like owning it and sort of standing in it as people struggle and like being around for the struggle part. Because what I've seen happen unproductively is people say Black Lives Matter, somebody says something crazy back. And I do consider All Lives Matter to be a crazy response. Yeah. And then people sort of like, they negotiate, right? And there's nothing, I don't have anything to negotiate with you. We can totally, we, I want you to hear where I'm coming from, but I don't have, there's no concession here. There's no, like, I don't have anything to give up in this space because already so much is at risk for me. That's one thing. And the second thing is that some of this is the work of white people, right? That like white people can do work around, around race that I cannot do. White people will have conversations and spaces that I will never be in. They can use privilege to disrupt in ways that I will never be able to. And they need to carry that burden. That's not my burden, right? And I can, and I can sit in that, that it is not my work to do all the time. And I can totally be the person to be the catalyst and say, y'all, somebody need to talk about this, right? Like this is, a, this is an issue. But white people need to step up too and not only do it when invited or when like somebody dies or you know what I mean? Like, because black people have to deal with this trauma whether Trayvon got killed or not, right? Like whether Mike got killed or Eric or Renisha or Rakia or Martise got beat, like the work is still real. And white people need to own that too, that it's not, it's not only important when there's like this visceral violence that happens that the world talks about, that there's other violence and trauma that's happening every day. And like a part of your privilege, if you are committed to the work, is disrupting the impact of the privilege you have. Uh, I don't think I had a response other than I like statistics uh, because people respond to numbers. Hmm. And so just a quick plug, but mappingpoliceviolence.org, um, I use that in Selma, actually, when I was speaking and the, the elder before me was saying all lives matter, basically, and it just broke my heart to hear such this, like, this amazing black woman that I admire stand on a stage and say that, black lives, that all lives matter. And I mean, we know it's true that all lives do matter. That is very true. But all lives aren't being taken in these streets like black people's lives are. So um, that's why you have to name things. And there is power in naming that it's black lives. That are that are being taken and being stolen away, um, you know, while everyone else gets to do whatever they want to do in their bodies, but we can't just live and breathe in our own. So just stand in it. Just say Black Lives Matter. Period. And and you know, <laughs> let them struggle. Deray's, you know, he's more for the conversation. I'm just. It's a period at the end of my statement. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. 
My name's Kevin Block Schwank. I just had a question. Um, looking at the perspective of, let's say, the last couple of decades, like, is it worse these days? I mean, I keep hearing about black people getting beaten and shot, and it wasn't like I never heard about that sort of thing in the 90s or 10 years ago, but it seemed like very rare. And then the last few years, it just seems like a flood. And I don't know, like, was it always this bad and we just weren't hearing about it, or is something actually getting worse? I thought you'd be in a good position to answer that. Yeah. Why me? Oh, ho. uh. Mm. I think it is, um, and this is not to be offensive in any way, but that the place of privilege to even be able to ask, is it getting worse, is, it's like, it's a lot. Um, that was just really deep. Because for me, I'm only 25, so I've only experienced two decades of being black. <laughs> um, and... From what I know, you know, I was very young when Rodney King got beat, but I remember that, and I remember every other black person who has been in the national news for being abused or killed or whatever it is. So from my experience, it's always been bad. Um, from my grandparents' experience, from my, my mother's experience that I did know, um, it was bad for them too. Um, depending on what black person you ask in America and what they've experienced, our whole lives are full of traumatic experiences while being black. And also you have to talk about what does violence look like? Because violence for me does not always look like um, a black person being beaten by the police. Um, being in all white spaces and dealing with white privilege and listening to um, people of privilege not be mindful of how words matter. Um, around people of color and black folks, that could be a violent space as well. Um, but for me, I feel like as long as America has been a thing, it's been um, dangerous for black people. And the only thing I add, uh, I'll try and do three quick things. One is, is that when we one is that we have we all have these narratives, right, of, of trauma and pain, and just like Netta said, is that the trauma looks different. So I think about. I think about what does it mean to have grandparents who are sharecroppers, right? Or what does it mean to the intergenerational trauma of reading? You know, this is something we talked about, and I, I did on Twitter, this idea about like, you know, can you raise your hand if you are a second or third generation reader? If any of you, I'm a third generation reader. Let's see, okay, interesting. Uh, and when we do that in, in, in rooms of people of color, it's like everybody, right? Like, uh, like my great grandmother knew how to write her name, and that was like all she knew how to write, and that was, it. Um, and like, what does it mean when that's the story of a people, right? Like the tra that, that is traumatic and that means something in, in spaces or, you know, like in my own life, um, you know, both my parents are drug addicts. I remember when people shot so close to the, the house that we slept on the floor because it's harder for bullets to go through the floorboard than the wall, right? Like, and, and that sort of stuff was normal. Like I didn't, I only thought that was crazy as an adult. Cause like as a kid, like everybody, I don't know, everybody did it. And it was like, oh, you sleep on the floor. Um, so when I think about the way trauma looks, it looks differently. And I do think that sort of in the spirit of what I think you asked, there is this interesting thing about erasure, right? That black people, either our stories have been erased or we have not been the people telling them. And that changes the story, right? And now we get to tell it. So what is different, and as somebody who, I mean, we read the news all day, we're tweeting all day about it. It is like, holy something. Like, <laughs> it, it seems so consistent now, right? And it's because we are actually being able to tell the story of our own trauma. Not only are we telling it, but we get to tell it in real time, which is a different, that is like a different moment in blackness. We've never been able to do that before, which makes this space, you think about Martin and Malcolm is that they spoke to, you know, we can speak to 100,000 people in two tweets. Martin and Malcolm had to do it in these like controlled moments, right? Where it was like a radio broadcast or it was a newspaper thing or it was meeting the church where like we can just sort of be like, I remember when the kids at UVA tweeted me and said, DeRay, something happened to Martise. And I tweeted, I tweeted, I, I'm getting tweets about a kid named Martise Johnson at UVA being beaten. Is this, is this real? Somebody send me a link. These kids write back something, something, not a link. And I'm like trying to be cautious about what it will it mean to use my platform to get people in a tizzy, right? So then I like 
I get on the phone with a UVA kid. I'm like, can you just tell me this is real? And she, her like voice is cracking and she's like, it's real. And I'm like, cool. I call the UVA president's office. I'm like, hi, this is DeRay McKesson. Can you tell me what happened with Marty Johnson? And they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, okay, cool. They send me to communications. Communications is like, we don't know. Me and Netta on text. I'm like, Netta just got on the phone with UVA. Netta tweets, everybody call UVA. <laughs> 1,200 people retweet it. We flood their phones, right? And we like, and that is something that we have never, like that is new. Like being able to do that is new. So CNN's calling me being like, DeRay, do you know anybody in at UVA? And I'm like, yep, I know these two kids I've been talking to. That are like, and you know, we are able to like use the space that we've created to like create space for other people, right? So people calling me like, are you going to UVA? Nope, the kids down there got it, but I'm gonna do whatever I can to like amplify. And like the fact that we have, we are just two people out of many people who have like the power to do that. So with Martise, you think about like within two hours of us tweeting about it, Jezebel wrote about it. It. Ebony had a tweet. Ebony like was tweeting about it. Complex magazine was tweeting about it. like, and that is because like we all had the power to like shape a story and make it news, and that is new. But the trauma has been consistent. Great answer. I love you. Good one. Thank you. <laughs> You're so funny. Yeah, though. I like feel lame talking after that. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering if either of you had any. Uh, thoughts or on sort of like the relationship between police brutality in general and police brutality and racism, because um, that's something that in a lot of conversations with white people, I run into like, well, cops are X, Y, and Z in general. And, and What's the X, Y, and Z? Like, help me understand. Like, I'm like you understand not the challenge. Like, power hungry and, and corrupt and they, beat people for no, like, you know, police brutality is everywhere and people who have a hard time seeing that it is also a race problem in addition to just how the police are, are run or organized or whatever. Um, I guess my question is like, how can you sort of parse that out in a way that is more digestible to people, I guess? The police shouldn't, I mean, the police, and I think we differ about the role of the police. I really, I do think there should be police. <laughs> I do. They just shouldn't be like they are. Um, the police shouldn't be hurting anybody, right? And like, it, and some people, I've, I've come to accept that like some people don't want to see race, right? So today, I, and if any of you follow me on Twitter, you heard me say this, but like I was eating breakfast and I saw that man with skin, head on his eyebrows, strolling into jail, and I almost lost it. I'm like sitting down at the restaurant, like couldn't, I like couldn't focus for a minute. I'm like, sort of want to cry, sort of want to just go lay down. Like, I don't know how he kills one person, wounds five people, carjacks somebody, and breaks into somebody's house, and they tase him. Not that they should have killed him, because, you know, we can live in a world without people getting killed. But that is wild to me when I think about Tamir Rice being killed in three seconds, right? And there is this thing that, like, that is, that is race. That, that, that's where race comes up. You know, this interesting thing, people don't really push back on us about, like, the police are crazy. Because, like, what I would say to them is, like, they shouldn't be. Like, I, that's not a justification for crazy. Just because everybody's crazy. Right? Like, that is, like, a, that is crazy. Um, and I do, I, yeah, I'm convinced that people like don't want to see race. And I think there are enough examples, like when you, when you look at the videos, right, or the one that just came out about Jason Harris, and people are like, but DeRay, he had, a, he had a screwdriver. And I'm like, if the police kill people for carrying screwdrivers, this is a crazy, right? If you think that's okay, you might as well just line us up, right? This is, like, take us all out if it takes a screwdriver f to justify the police, like, being afraid for their life, right? That is just like... That is just too much to me. I have to believe that there are like non-lethal ways to deal with people. And if they're not, then we just need to um, then disband all the police, right? If that's the only alternative, then like let it be a free for all and let us call it what it is. Cause this can't be the only way that we police people. Thank you. You gotta have the only solution. Cause my solution is there shouldn't be police. <laughs> 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 that's some amen. Yeah. <laughs> Hi guys, um, Netta, I really appreciated you um, saying something earlier, which is the power of naming things. And one of the things that I notice um, that you two talk about a lot, but also that's come up tonight, is just naming what you and so many other black folks are going through as what it is, which is trauma. Um, I think that's 
surprisingly hard for some people to understand. And um, one of the things I've been struggling with is I, I, um, I work with Penn and I taught a creative writing um, program at, at a uh, jail out in Walpole for about three years. And um, there's so much trauma that that goes on in these guys' daily lives. And it's really, really hard to sit down with them every couple of weeks and talk about writing and talk about healing, because how can you heal when the trauma is still going on and there's no end in sight? Um, so I guess my, my question would be, you guys, you guys have done such clearly an amazing job um, organizing and helping people connect to this movement. And what I'm wondering is how we can help support people specifically through the trauma. Um, I think, you know, a lot of it I'm sure is just showing up and I know, you know, protesting is so important and just showing up and being there, but um, I guess I've been trying to be more mindful lately of the fact that this is real trauma and it's going on every day and I'm, I'm wondering what I and others like me can do to just support you and, and everybody else because it's not traumatic for me, clearly. Whew. Um, I think, I guess the only way I could talk about how I deal with trauma, um, most days I'm just ignoring it, which is not healthy, which is not good, which my therapist tells me not to do. Um, so the second option is I do have a therapist. Um, I've never had one, but I definitely feel that, um, especially for black folks, because we, normally grow up in situations where our family tell us that mental issues or mental health issues are white people's stuff. That's not our stuff, but that's definitely everybody's stuff. Like, I encourage everyone to have a therapist, only just because it's good to talk to someone who doesn't know you or doesn't know your life, who can help you sort things out. Um, so journaling for me, you doing creative writing with folks in jail, I think that's definitely great because writing really does help me a lot. Um, and um, being around like, my way of taking a break is like being around him or the rest of our crew or just being around my family. Um, and because the movement is leaderful, not leaderless, but not one, one specific person, mm -hmm. we're able to take steps back and other people step forward and when they're tired, they get a, they get a chance to take a rest and then we go back up. Um, so I think just having that team like atmosphere to where, so if say you're a friend, you have a black friend or something and she's like, girl, I'm really tired. The protest was real crazy today. You know, my hands been up, everything hurts. <laughs> Um, yeah, whatever. My hands been up? Yeah, my no. hands been up. My hands tired. I don't know. <laughs> like, um, I think as a way for her to step back, like you could encourage self-care, self-care time. Like, what do you need? How can I help support you? So I think that's the best, the best way is to just ask, how can you help support um, the person who you obviously have identified needs that kind of time? I think, so I'll just start by saying I appreciate um, you naming your privilege, right? This is not traumatic for you. That, and that is good. important, right? That like, I, I've met very few white people. I've met a lot of white people who talk about being in the work and very few white people who can talk about their privilege, right? And so I appreciate that. Um, and you did it in a way that was not like, was, I did not experience guilt. And I appreciate that too. So I want to name that. <laughs> um, I think that like in, so I agree with everything that I said about like the, pers the personal part, sort of bringing it to the, this macro level about blackness. I do think one of the beautiful things about blackness, right, is the way that we have, um, the way that we have used culture to cope, right? And the way mm -hmm. that we use culture to like, to be alive and be people in the midst of such incredible trauma. And I think that that is like the, like that is where I've seen us like take refuge in our song and our dance and our, and like the way we write and in the way that we laugh and the way that we love has been like how we have coped for so long. And I think that the more that we create, that we create spaces where people do that and that we validate people in spaces, um, like that is powerful, right? So like in creative writing, like the more that we tell people, like not only do you have a story to tell, but I wanna hear it, right? Like mm -hmm. that is that is the magic of what it means to be alive, right? That like not only am I, not only do I have something to give, but it matters. Um, and that has been culture for us, right? Like that we have, we have literally like, you know, we were right before we came out here, we were, Definitely singing uh, track. Hey, what's queen. up? Hello. 
Mm-hmm. She's my trap queen. Mm-hmm. Right? And like, and you know, Lord knows we struggle with Fetty. Like, Fetty Wap has some problematic times. <laughs> um, but we can appreciate like how he is in some ways complicating what it means to love in trauma, right? And he's using um, these like really potentially self-destructive tropes around drugs as a means of his way to negotiate capitalism. That might be a stretch, but I like, <laughs> but I, but I, but like, Ooh, Doray. thank you, Fetty Wap, right? But like, uh, but I can, st- I can love him and I can, he can be a part of my daily routine because he is like, he is, I believe he is coping with the bando. Like, you know, as, yes, you like that? I believe that he's like coping with it as he's doing it. Um, and, I, and I do think that culture has been the place that we have found love and each other for Ooh. so long. And that is like unbelievably important. I think about all our kids who like don't believe in themselves because nobody's ever believed in them, right? Who like just haven't had a space to be expressive. The bando. Yes, you like that, the bando. No. Yes. Hi. Shush. I'm my tippy toes so you can hear me. Um, so first I want to thank you um, for acknowledging that this isn't only about black men's lives mattering, but also about women and trans folks. Yeah. Um, just so everybody can kind of hear that loud and proud. Um, and then so my question is kind of, where is the space in this movement for the unifying of blackness? Um, there, I know something that I've been dealing with here in Boston is a lot of we have a lot of folks here from like the islands, right? And so they're like, no, those are the other, you know, this is an issue that is affecting the other black folks. And so my family's from the Dominican Republic and they're like, oh no, that's not an issue that affects us. So where, where, is, where is the room in the movement to kind of unify um, blackness cross-culturally? I don't know if we get, you know, it's some things that I think that like, I believe in the power of talking, right? And I totally believe in the power of words, which is why I, I tweet all the time. Um, but some things I think people won't get until they get it. And like I, I, all the people who tell us to go home, it's like, and we tell them, we'll be out there when they kill your child. We will. We'll be in the streets for you too. Like you didn't like the protests and you didn't, but when, but when it's somebody like Martise Johnson, who is like the model student, all them kids at UVA are turned up right now, right? And, and they were, they believed before, but now they're like, oh, this is, this is at my house. And I think for some people, not that this is the, the UVA thing, but for some people, they won't get it until it really is theirs. And, I, and like, I get that, like, uh, and I said this earlier, that like protest will always be more important than it is popular. And like, I get that. So, you know, I'm not trying to sit in people's living room and be like, don't worry that like when you put on a hoodie, you black as me, right? Common, I'm struggling with common. Common, when it's not, when you're not like bald and shiny and like on David Letterman, you know, like you another in the hood and that's real, right? And some people won't get it until they have to get it, until somebody shoots somebody they love and da 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 or like it's their cousin and that is what it is. So I don't, I don't have any, nothing even remotely deep to say about how to help people understand their struggle. I, again, believe that some people um, other themselves from blackness because they believe that they can tap into the privilege of whiteness. And that is crazy to me, right? Because the reality, I mean, that's like one of those like dangerous tropes that white supremacy does is it says like, you are not me, but you might have some of me. And that is like this thing that like, we know not to be true, but people still participate in it. Um, and that to me is wild. So I don't, that's wild to me. The second portion is totally my answer. The other other black, new black, might not really be all the way black. I don't have time for that because white supremacy sees you as, guess what, black. And I'm still out here putting myself on the line for you. So they will come around when something happens and they, they need a rally cry and some folks who will go to war for them, they will come around. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Hi, Twist Out. Hi. Yes. Hey. I'm so <laughs> glad y'all are here. I am. Um, twist out. So, so twist out is from Chicago. Yeah. And she has um she has roots in Mississippi. And so when I became my family historian, it became important for me to to understand the weight of history just as much as where my family was from, like what counties, where they were, at what time, uh, but what those stories meant. And with those stories came a whole lot of trauma and a lot of a lot of woe. And so for you all, you societal engineers, you folks who are on the front lines, how do you all get out of bed when, the, when, when, when you're sitting with the blues? Like, how do you press on even when you're tired? 
not to get too, you know, in your business. I don't think I've ever heard you talk about this. About what? How do I get out of bed? I'm ready. When I'm tired? <laughs> or when, when you got the blues? I want to hear. <laughs> I can't stand you. <laughs> uh, ooh, that's a doozy. Um, Cause there have been plenty of days. Okay, I'll use this weekend because there was the shooting at Ferguson PD, right? I hate doing media. Um, I particularly hate talking in front of cameras and reporters with news news channels, they always try it. Um, and I always have to be like on the guard and I hate having to feel like that. So I prefer not to have to talk to the press. Like reporters print all day, that's fine. But like I found that reporters on TV always try me. Um, so what do you mean, John? They try to try me. you? Yeah, well, okay, I'm sorry. So try, trying it means, um, <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> trying it means that, uh, so like you're testing me. So okay. you're, you're trying, you're searching for something okay. and I'm, you know, I'm just not going for it. And just that is a G out there. We, we made the protest and the reporter's like, can I talk to you? And she's like, only if you can keep walking. And you're like, no, no. <laughs> the cameraman's like, <laughs> It's like, Nada, you're hilarious. Right, because you want to talk to me. But anyway, so <laughs> the thing is, um, so the night of the shooting, we were super dead tired, but we would not leave until our friend Kayla was out of the PD um, because she had went to go get some of our comrades out of jail. Um, and then that's when the shooting happened. And then they like put the PD on like lockdown. So we like moved and parked. I wouldn't leave until she was there. I wouldn't, and then when she came out, maybe like an hour and a half later, like 3 a.m., I drove her home and then drove myself home. Whew, that whole ride home, like I knew I was dead tired, <coughs> but I also knew that the next day, and like it wasn't even a thing we had to all discuss. It was just like, we need to be on our A game with the media tomorrow, because one, we know it's gonna be a, um, S-H-I-T storm <laughs> and then we also know that the police are definitely already starting their their narrative of what they think happened and how they want to blame protesters so you have to be like on point and always be ready to combat their crazy stories um, and so I was dead tired and did one interview with CNN at like 3 a.m. on my drive home. Woke up 5.30 and did another one. Went back to sleep. Somehow some woman <laughs> got my number from DeRay and had to go to Ferguson at 12 noon. Um, and just by hearing that I was there, people just instantly like, oh, can I talk to you? 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 And as much as I wanted to say, no, I'm tired, I'm sleepy, I don't want you in my face, you weren't here yesterday, you wouldn't be here if it was a protester, I knew that I had a job to do, and that job was to defend our community, defend the protest, defend the reason why we're out here. And so I'm putting on my best face and being as friendly as I can force myself while still defending the protest at the same time. Um, so I think I, I do it because I love black people, period. That's it. That's the only thing that got me out of my bed because if they would have discredited the protest, who on God green earth, like who knows what will happen. So I just do it because of my love of blackness. That's it. Because if we, if we get tired and we stop, who's gonna do it? Mm. Especially black women. I had to throw that, that in That was there. good. DeRay know I love to talk about women. She do. Yep. I'm all about it. So I'm <laughs> Um, I don't know why I've been a lot of hands up recently. I don't like, know. I know. Um, so I'll say, is it, I'll acknowledge that it is hard, right? And I like, I think about my own, I like miss my, I like miss my sister. I like haven't talked to my sister. I, me and Tere, my sister's name is Tere. We're not twins. Yes, our names rhyme. <laughs> um, but you know, I haven't seen her in like, at least nine months and I like love my sister. Uh, my sister's two kids, I like love my niece and nephew and I just like haven't seen them. And we Skype and she'll text me and it just isn't, I miss her. Um, and I like, my great grandmother passed away and I like miss her. I like think of her often and I miss her and my father. You know, I had a really good cry not too long ago with my father. Um, I called him and I was like, Daddy, can you talk? And, he, and then my like voice is cracking and he's like, yeah. And I'm like, Bleh. Um And I like, I miss him. Um, and I like haven't seen them in so long because of the protests, right? I also know, just like Netta said, that the work we do is bigger than us. And that like the reason I fight every day is because I like, I taught and there are these, there are kids who I will, I like, 
they deserve to be in a world that is better than this. And I'm just trying to do my part, right? And it means that some days, like this morning was hard for me to get, I was excited to see that kid at Northeastern. So like, he was the reason I got out of bed today, but it was hard because all, I'm like scrolling my timeline and everything's bad. It's like 10 o'clock in the world. It's like, Lord, it's bad this morning. Like, I can't even think of, you know, every time I, I tweet Trap Queen, that, movie, that uh, video Trap Queen, that's me trying to smile. Like, I just need something to like, and I love those little kids. Um, but I like fight for my students, right? So when I think about, um, and I fight for my niece and nephew, Isaac and Sayla, but like they are knowing that like they might have a better world because we did something is important to me. And I also know that like, um, I believe that like the more people know the truth, the more radical they'll be and we'll all be able to fight differently. So at the beginning, it was like a smaller group of people protesting and then the protest spread, right? And it, and it means that like we can fight differently. So the reason I don't need to go to UVA is they got it, they got it, right? So I'm just helping them like see that they got it and I'm texting the girl being like, you got it, shut it all down, right? Like do it, like sit in the presence of it, like go that, you know, Netta is, Netta is really miss shut it down, the one person protest. She will do a one person, like Walgreens was closed one day. She was like, Deray, one person protest. <laughs> like, Shut it down. They wouldn't let her in and she was mad. Um, but, <laughs> but it is this thing of like, we fight for, we, we're fighting for, um, for other people. And the reality is like people fought for us. That is also really important, right? Like we met in Selma, people who put their lives on the line for us and we are sort of paying it forward the way that we can. And the reality is it's dangerous anyway. People are like, are you afraid to die? I'm afraid to live in this world. So like, so what, right? Like I'm afraid to walk down the street in an America where the police watch the blood drain out of a 12 year old and he dies six 16 hours later. That scares me. That scares me more than the shooter does, right? And in St. Louis, the police have killed seven people since August 9th. That is scary. So you want to talk about accountability, like you want to talk about violence, that's, the violence existed before the protest began. The violence existed on August 9th before anybody came out in the streets when Darren Wilson killed him, right? So like we know that we like exist in this space and you know, more people should be, more people should be more upset than they are. But we also know that like, you know, and I can, I think I can speak for Netta, we never would have shut down the street before the protest. That the protest like allowed us to like find our voice differently, right? And allowed us to like, shush. I might have shut the street down. She didn't though, but she didn't. <laughs> um, but it allowed us to like think about our power differently. So now I can sit in any street in America, sit there all day long, read a book, like totally chill. It's like not a thing anymore. And we, you know, Netta, I don't know if you've ever seen Netta with the police, but it is definitely a sight to see. Um, Cause Netta is on 10,000. You're like, Netta, stop yelling at the police, man. Um, but it is this thing about like, we are much more comfortable with confrontation because we also like the myths around what we can and can't do have been shattered. So I can stand next to the police officer and be you know, like, we were out there the other day and this officer would not tell us his name. And I don't know if you followed, but the DOJ said they all have to wear badges. So I go up to him and a legal observer is like, Deray, he won't say his name. So I go up to him and I say real nice, like, I just want to know your name. And he's like stone faced, right? And I'm like, I can, we can do this the hard way or the easy way. Like you tell me or I'm gonna ask everybody I know. He's like, he's like, you know, um, he just like won't respond. So I take a picture of him and, I, and I'm like, so-and-so, like badge 201, Beverly Police Department. And I stand there. Four minutes later, all his information. And I say like, here you are. And like, I don't know what they're gonna do. Cause like in August, people were taking out loans in the police officer's name, which I do not advocate, but they were doing it. Um, and it was this thing of like, the world did not need to know your name. I just asked you, but you wouldn't tell me, right? And like, we can do, like, that is a different way that we can sort of confront in a way that we just never could do before. I also want to say, um, and just add that it's in just, because I always am showing respect to our ancestors, it's in our blood to, to wake up. It's not in our blood to give up. We haven't, we've never given up. I we've like always, thank you. Um, <laughs> We're just a resilient people, period. Because if we would if we would have given up when they wanted us to give up, we would have never made it past slavery. We would have never made it past them boats. We would have never made it past the motherland. We would have never made it, period. So I don't think it's in us to ever give up, period. And hope has always been a uh, part of our story, right? Like hope is this belief that our tomorrows can be better than our todays. And that has been so real in blackness when it should not have been, right? When everything was stacked against us, we still sang, we still waited in the water for our freedom, right? We still sung Sweet Swing Low Sweet Chariot, which was like telling stories about how we could be liberated. Like we have always found ways to be free. Thanks, y'all. One last question and then we're gonna give these awards. I love your glasses. 
Thanks. Um, <laughs> so I really appreciate this, this um, and I think something that I've connected with is this, this message, of, message of blackness, and this is, this is about being black. And i um, working in a school and, and seeing a lot of uh, black and brown boys and girls being shown love. I think a lot of times, and it continues to be, that shown love in spite of their blackness and shown love when, um, you know, they finally get your first day and, and things like that. And that has been really disheartening and I think eye-opening for me personally to see that it is it, how, how, how early it is taught and how it's, how it's taught in this place where we're supposed to be safe and you're supposed to be, you know. Can you like time off for a second? I don't know what, I like don't understand. So, okay, so. I didn't hear it. I like don't understand what it means. What I'm pushing to understand not to challenge. Yep. Like this idea of being shown love despite their black, like I just don't understand. So, I think I see in, we have a really, currently I'm working at a school that's really diverse and I, and I think that there's a very poignant difference between how um, some educators are, show, show love and positivity to different races in their own classroom, right? And, okay. um, and I think part of that relation that when, this, when the, these dots were being clicked for me is watching uh, just black kids play with the, the white girl's hair and like, you know, that this, there's this like, when they're really young, knowing just, <clears throat> sorry. We still here. We yeah, still yeah. Here. I'm trying to find my question. Um, I want to be this message of, of trying to teach the self-love and trying to kind of deflect that being interested with, with whiteness that I see from like black and brown kids that are just so young and, and that, that, um, that how, how disheartening that is and how, how it's, you know, being really interested with, with, with that and what, and I know that you're a, a, an educator and what, what do you think is, what is the message that, that those kids need to hear um, from their teachers? And, and how is that spun that, it, that it's about them and giving them space to, to be empowered and tell their story? And, and um, just how does that work in a school building? Because I don't, I don't think it is currently. It's not. Can you explain the example of the black girl? Sure. Playing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Part of an organization that um, is great and is pretty white and is I think that's kind of, that's the fabric of our the you know educational landscape right now a lot of white women working in education and um, I just always remember watching these uh, three little black girls sit around one of sitting next to one of my friends and playing with their hair and talking about how. It's like your hair's so pretty, mm. and, and running her hands through her hair. Can I, and can I paraphrase the question? Is yeah. it this idea that like, what does it mean? Uh, it seems like you are calling out this like, what you see to be this fascination with whiteness at a young age in school buildings, right? Mm -hmm. And like, how do we teach self self love in in that context? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That oh. was so good. Wow. That was yeah. <laughs> you know, my quick. Um, answer like I appreciate you calling it out right because it's real and, mm -hmm. and like the naming thing is huge and um, part, I'm struggling with like what to do in the classroom what I will say macro is that like black people don't see black love enough right mm -hmm. so I think about and I like Shonda Rhimes I think about Scandal that episode of Scandal about the protest I actually really like it not everybody likes it but I do um, and I use that episode as like a great example of like it is so what I think is really powerful about that episode is that like uh, as much as as much as powerful as Olivia is live right like she couldn't combat the power of the people I think that is huge but what is sort of troubling about that show right is that we don't actually see any healthy black relationships mm -hmm. as much as I love it Liv doesn't love a single black person who loves her back mm -hmm. her mother's crazy her father's crazy she don't like the senator her boyfriend's white which is fine interracial relationships are great but like literally there's no there's no relationship <coughs> in the show where a black person love, like loves her back. 
and that is a problem, right? And it's those sort of images that we ingest and don't realize that we are also internalizing that story. So I think about, so I'll just like name that as like, a, as like the macro thing. In schools, I do think there's a different way that we can, I, I think there's something different about black educators that can do it, right? So in my classroom, I could walk in every day and tell every one of my kids, I love you, right? Walk around, tap them, be like, I love you, I love you. And I could do that like was culturally safe in my space in a way that potentially it might not be safe for everybody, right? So like I had a different ability to do that. But I do think there's something about telling this, telling these stories, right? So what are the children's books that are in classrooms, right? Is it really all the white kids, like it's really all these stories about how great it is to be white in the world that like black kids have to ingest and white kids are not ingesting any story about people of color, right? Like those sort of things are really important. I would extend that to like relationships around uh, gender, right? Like are all the stories ones where men are like changing the world and the women are like, standing by being like, thank God for changing the world, right? Like, and it's those sort of things that like actually happen at a young age mm -hmm. that we don't realize how like disruptive that is. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, thanks. Mm. I think it's time to uh, give out some awards. What were you gonna say? Say it. Oh. I'm sorry, did I cut you off? <laughs> no, no. I, apologize. I was just trying to think what my comment was gonna be, mm. but I, I understand, um, that's, I was fascinated by hearing him say that the little black girls were uh. so googly-eyed over the white girls' hair. Um, being that I went to an all-white school all my life, um, I never had that obsession because I lived in a very black household and everybody was black, we loved being black, no perms nowhere. <laughs> Um, so I went to school with my puffs, and it would be the opposite, only they weren't googly-eyed over my hair. They were, what's wrong touch with your it. hair? They Why is your... Oh, yeah, they touched my hair in kindergarten, and my mom had to come to school and tell them, don't ever touch, <laughs> don't ever touch my hair again. Um, but there was this obsession with me being so different. I'm brown, you mm -hmm. know, and they would say, oh, she's tan. No, 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 I'm black. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I knew to say that at like five. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that there was something special about my hair that they called different. Um, so yeah, it is troubling for kids who don't grow up in a house like mine where just blackness is everything. You do, you are, you, you love what you are force fed all the time. So if all you see is live loving everybody but a black person on scandal, or if you see, um, you know, just blue eyed, bl blonde haired white women on TV every day, and you know, you just see the hair and the wind is blowing through their hair and it don't move through yours, you know, of course you're gonna think that that's, that's it. <laughs> it don't move through yours. <laughs> <laughs> but of course you're going to think, yes. thank you, yes. but if you think that that's it, of course that's what you're going to go for sure. and what you're going to admire. Um, so I, f I feel for <sighs> uh, the babies mm -hmm. all the time because that's, that's, that's sad. I want them to, I always want black kids to love themselves as much as, as much as, um, I don't know. As much as a grandma loves somebody, mm. I think I have to think about that. Like, yeah. my grandma loved me through a lot. Mm. And God knows I got on her nerves. But she loves me. Like, a grandma love is like that agape love. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want the babies to have for themselves. They'll learn. I think on that wonderful wish, um, we will thank Janetta Elsie. And DeRay McKesson. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> and, and we have some, some lovely parting gifts. <laughs> it's for Janetta. Thank you. All right. And for Mr. DeRay McKesson. This is a big book. For their work in creating a people's history of Ferguson, Penn New England honors Janetta Elsie and DeRay McKesson with the 2015 Howard Zinn Freedom to Write Award. What, what was white skin privilege and white supremacy? And why did the poorest white feel superior to Dr. King and Mrs. Rosa Parks. <laughs> <laughs>